Hi, I'm Mike Rinder. I was formerly the head of the Office of Special Affairs of Scientology and the international spokesperson for Scientology. Today, I have a very different role, and I am very happy to be here with the Watchman Fellowship on the apologetics profile. Only L. Ron Hubbard's words are valid in Scientology, and he's dead. So he can't write any revisions of anything that he did. They're just stuck with that, and they will keep doing exactly that until someone from outside the organization stops them from doing it. L. Ron Hubbard, um, convinced or convinces Scientologists that he has the answers to all the problems of mankind, he and he alone. The inner elite core of Scientology is called the C organization. And when you join the C organization, as I did when I was 18, right after graduating high school, you sign a contract. And I say contract, but it's called the C org contract for a billion years. My guest today is Michael Rinder, who was one of the top Scientology executives uh, headed up their feared and dreaded International Office of Special Affairs, which uh, oversaw much of the uh, litigation, uh, harassment, and attacks on perceived enemies of the Church of Scientology, known as SPs, or suppressive persons. Uh, Mike Rinder was one of the chief public protectors of the Church of Scientology, their controversial leader David Miscavige, and celebrity parishioners such as Tom Cruise and John Travolta. Uh, as an official spokesperson for the church, Mike valiantly defended the reputation of Scientology from a, a growing number of unflattering investigative reports published internationally on uh, network television, magazines, and newspapers. But then, in 2007, in a shocking 180, Mike Rinder escaped the Church of Scientology and has now become one of its most vocal critics. Uh, he teamed up with Leah Remini on a and &E for the Emmy award-winning docuseries, Scientology and the Aftermath. Now, Mike has released a brand new book, A Billion Years, My Escape from the Highest Ranks of Scientology. Mike, welcome to Apologetics Profile. Thank you so much, James. It's lovely to be here. Well, I want to right up the, off the bat ask you about the title, uh, A Billion Years. Why A Billion Years? Because the inner elite core of Scientology is called the C organization. And when you join the C organization, as I did when I was 18, right after graduating high school, you sign a contract. And I say contract, but it's called a C org contract for a billion years. In, in effect, dedicating yourself to all, for all eternity, to achieving the aims of Scientology. So that's what the, the title references, the fact that I was a member of the C organization. The C organization, um, you live and work and are a part of a communal organization where all the, um, all your living accommodations, your food, everything is provided by the Scientology organization. You don't live in a separate house outside or have a car or, you know, the normal things. It's sort of like a um, an order of the of the Catholic priesthood. Uh, and only C organization members are allowed to occupy the highest levels in the hierarchy of Scientology. So it's it's a, um, a one billion year contract. So obviously the church believes in future lives that it, not this just this life, but in future lives you're going to be uh, serving um, the needs of humanity through the Church of Scientology and their interests for one billion years. And and you obviously came up a little short on on the one billion years. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, let yes, me tell you did. this, Mike. Uh, you know, we're a Christian organization at Watchman Fellowship. We do outreach and training in the area of how, how to kind of share the good news of Jesus Christ with like other faiths and religions. So I've had for you know more than 30 years, I've had all kinds of interaction with leaders of other of other religions. You know, we, we work with world religion. I've done you know, debates and dialogues with um, with Muslim clerics, Muslim scholars, um, apologists, uh, with Latter Day Saints. I'm a former Mormon, and I've had a new, numerous public, uh, respectful dialogue and interaction with Muslim. I mean, with Mormons, uh, we've we do outreach in the area of cults and the occult. Uh, I've talked to psychics and mediums and. Uh, and even in, in atheism, uh, we have something called the Atheist and Christian Book Club, where we do a monthly gathering wow. <laughs> uh, with uh, believers and skeptics. And so I've interacted with some of the top uh, atheist authors and, and, and talked to them about their books and their ideas. Never in, in the, the whole history of my interaction with religions have I come across anything like the Church of Scientology. We've been... Uh, sued by the Church of Scientology one time for nine and a half million dollars. We've been threatened to have our offices raided and to uh, to seize all of our files and and correspondence and even even the, the data, the hard drives off of our computers. Uh, we've had um, our offices have been infiltrated with operatives for Scientology that have both in our Birmingham, Alabama and our Arlington, Texas office has been infiltrated. And I, I'm thinking I have never seen this in any religion I've ever dealt with before. Uh, one, of the, one of the critics told us early on in our, in our interaction with, with Scientology, uh, they said, James, never forget, uh, Scientology is not a religious cult. It is a terrorist organization pretending to be a religious cult. So uh, I don't know. That's that's hyperbole, I'm sure. But 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 I will mm. be able to say that uh, it's it's groups like Scientology that give cults a bad name. Yes. Uh, so uh. <laughs> can can you tell me what kind of of philosophy or or, or uh, technology? Why would a church behave this way? Well, let me say first of all, James. I think that you are too polite in referencing them as the Church of Scientology. That's what they want the world to believe, that they are a church or a religion. It's what Hubbard wanted the world to believe, but it is no such thing. And what is sort of unique about Scientology? Not sort of unique. It is unique. I've spoken also to a lot of, you know, now I interact with all sorts of religious scholars and people from other faiths, et cetera, et cetera. And Scientology has a very, um, a very unique part to it, which is many cults uh, or probably all cults have some godlike leader who is supposedly infallible and dictates what all the followers are supposed to think and do and how they're supposed to act. And Scientology certainly had that with L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard um, convinced or convinces Scientologists that he has the answers to all the problems of mankind, he and he alone, and that his answers are in the form of what he constantly referred to as a technology, not a belief system, not parables, not not teachings, technology, with the idea that that Im, Im sort of imparts a, an official, this is researched and proven uh, some way that you are going to attain um, all these things that he promised from Dianetics and Scientology. And he also says that you are required to do it exactly as I say. There is no interpretation. There is no deviation from the, here's what Hubbard says, this is what you do, so this is how you do it. But there is a part of what he calls the technology of Scientology, which is how do you destroy people who are questioning or against or in some way opposed to Scientology. And 
that doesn't mean that, that the, these are people who are running in with guns to shoot up a congregation. That means these are like journalists who are writing stories that Scientology doesn't like, or the Watchmen Fellowship who's providing, or can, who's providing information that Scientology doesn't like or disagrees with, that there is a technology, yes, a technology developed by L. Ron Hubbard on how you destroy such people. And it includes how you litigate against them, how you use litigation to to wear them down in a war of attrition, how you hire private investigators, investigate them, frame them for things. And this is the activities of the aforementioned Office of Special Affairs, the, the place that I used to be the head of. So you did that. You you basically followed the script, followed the uh, L. Ron Hubbard technology, and um, you uh, this this was not a decision that you came up with of how you were going to do this. You were just following protocol. That's exactly right. And the people that are there today are doing exactly the same thing. And if if they're gone tomorrow, someone else will step into that position and continue to do exactly the same thing, which is one of the things that's particularly dangerous about Scientology is that it can't change. It cannot um, evolve into a kind of gentler version of itself because only L. Ron Hubbard's words are valid in Scientology and he's dead. So he can't write any revisions of anything that he did. They're just stuck with that, and they will keep doing exactly that until someone from outside the organization stops them from doing it. Yeah, even in their in their technology, ironically, it's kind of like frozen in time. I, I uh, they were using telex as well into the internet age, and and then it's just like the e meter, this briefcase size thing full of electronics. You would think by now it would be an app on your smartphone or something, but yeah. it's like it's it's where Hubbard died and what he died in what eighty seven somewhere like that eighty six. 84, okay. Oh, I remember. In the Somewhere mid 80s, it's it <laughs> basically locked in at that point and it can't it can't uh, change much. So the current leader, David Miscavige, he is um, uh, just basically following the protocols, following the technology and doing what L. Ron uh, Hubbard put in place uh, before his death, correct? That's exactly right. And as are all Scientologists. It's not so you, just it's not just David Miscavige. It's like every Scientologist is operates on this principle. You you know Hubbard said, you are either one hundred percent in Scientology or you're out. There's no Scientology can is a fundamentalist organization. That you know a lot of religious organizations have fundamentalist wings. They have the people who are out on the fringes, who are the, the sort of wild and crazy uh, elements of their particular faith and do things that society frowns on or is, you know, abhorrent in some cases. Scientology is all fundamentalists. You can't be anything but a fundamentalist Scientologist. You have to be literal in your interpretation of the words of L. Ron Hubbard. Every Scientologist must be literal. And this is a, a part of the grip that Scientology manages to maintain on people is this lockstep, you have an exact pattern of behavior, an exact pattern of what's acceptable, an exact pattern of how you conduct your life, how you treat your children, how you relate to other people. It's all laid out by Hubbard and every Scientologist must do the same thing. And you can say, yeah, but you know, all religions are like that. Well, no, actually they're not. I mean, as you know, I have become good friends with Pastor Willie Rice at Calvary Baptist in Clearwater, who is a champion of exposing the abuses of Scientology in a community that generally has been very fearful of Scientology for good reason. Just like you, you, you know, 
you got to have some cojones to stand up and say, I, you know, these people, they're not Christian. They're not in agreement with our Christian beliefs. They are in fact opposed to them, et cetera, et cetera. But I have been to Calvary Baptist many times. I have attended services there. I've gone for Easter celebrations, for Christmas, for just all sorts of things that Willie invites me and he and his wife have become, you know, fairly good friends with me and my wife. And I have met a ton of people there, tons. And they are all, though they are all Christians, they all have a, a, a perspective on life that is unique to themselves based on or in accordance with their Christian beliefs. If you go to Scientology, you will find such lock, lockstep agreement about what is right and what is wrong and how every everything should be viewed in the world and how every person should be treated and how everybody should react to whatever news reports there are. And that is something that sets Scientology apart from other religious organizations. See, I, I no longer espouse the idea that Scientology is a religion. You say it's a, well, you said that someone said it's a terrorist organization masquerading as a religion. I usually say it's a business masquerading as a religion. Well, so, and historically, I mean, I think that is borne out as well because uh, you, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the founding of the church, but it really started off, Dianetics was not a religion. It was like a mental health, still is, a, a mental health practice, kind of a, it, it seemed to be somewhat a reaction to psych, to psychiatry and especially Freudian psychiatry, perhaps. So it starts off as a as a unlicensed mental health practice that if I if you and you can tell me they get in trouble with the Food and Drug Administration or with the with the, the government on that? Yes, ultimately. But Dianetics started as as you say, the, the title of Dianetics is Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. And it is that's its title to this day. Um, and it is considered to be the what they call the book one of Scientology. It is the, the founding text of the entire subject. And it was certainly not a religion. And it wasn't even, um, it, it was sort of a, a pop psychotherapy. And Hubbard sought to attain the endorsement of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Medical Association when he first published Dianetics. He thought that that would give it a boost, give it credibility, et cetera, et cetera. And they basically said, you're a quack. And that resulted in Hubbard determining that psychiatry was the boogeyman of planet Earth. I, and not just of Dianetics, not just the, 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 the evil doers who are out to destroy Dianetics. He, you know, from that early sort of beginning, grew this idea that psychiatry is the devil who is, and psychiatry is seeking to enslave all mankind and keep all people unhappy and, you know, under their thumb, and that only Scientology can can save the planet from the evils of psychiatry. But so, can, can you, Mike? Can you even practice um, um, treating somebody's mental health without uh, having a medical license to do that and charging them for it? Yes, yes, and this this is what Scientology does. Look, here's, here's what happened, James. It's not a like a well-told story, although Russell Miller and then in his book, Barefaced Messiah, and then Larry Wright in his Brilliant Going Clear sort of documents this history. Hubbard, he made a, a ton of money off Dianetics originally, and it was sort of a, a fad, and you know people would show up and pay him to lecture them and blah, blah, blah. 
but he spent money like a drunken sailor and ultimately the organizations that he created went into bankruptcy and long story short he lost the the rights to the copyrights of dianetics and that was why he started scientology mm. because Dianetics, and he also had this problem that he'd made these enormous promises that are still in Dianetics, like this this will cure cancer, bursitis, arthritis, blindness, being hobbled and lame, it, throw away your canes, throw away your glasses, Dianetics is here, it'll solve everything. And when that didn't turn out to be true, he had to come up with a new, okay, well, I've continued my research and now here is this wonderful thing that will accomplish all of what Dianetics said, and it's now addressing not just your reactive mind, which was what Dianetics is, and that was his invention, is there is this subconscious mind that causes all these problems in your life and makes you sick and makes you unhappy, et cetera, et cetera. No, we also need to address the spirit, and he called the spirit in Scientology the Phaeton. He just invented a word and said, this is the word we use, theta, thetan, and that's what Scientology is. He then decided, um, after, after announcing in Scientology in 1952, in 1954, he went, hmm, maybe we should be calling ourselves a religion. Maybe we should get religious status. Like, we couldn't be doing any worse that's effectively what he said. It, it couldn't make it worse. So maybe it will give us some advantages. Maybe people will be more inclined to come and get involved in Scientology if they think we're a religion. And maybe we can get tax exempt status and blah, 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 blah. And that was the start of why Scientology became a religion. And then they started using, you know, their funny eight pointed cross and dressing people up in clerical collars and holding a Sunday service, which is reading quotes from L. Ron Hubbard and doing things to try to appear to be like other religions, because there is a huge advantage to being a religion and particularly a tax exempt religion in the United States outside of the fact that you don't pay taxes you also get a, basically a pass on having to provide any, you're not accountable to any government agencies any longer. You don't have to provide any financial information. You, you can scream that your religious rights are being violated if someone, uh, you know, some government agency comes in. You don't have to follow the labor laws, like all sorts of wonderful advantages to take advantage of when you're an unscrupulous organization. And this is the, the sort of basis of Scientology being a religion. On our, our podcast, we have a really diverse audience. You know, a lot of our listeners uh, are very knowledgeable about the, the history and theology of Scientology and technology. Uh, they they will they will know you already from Scientology aftermath. They've watched every episode, and so they're way ahead of the curve. But we have people, a part of our audience, that this is all new to them. And so, right. you know, what is I, I wanted to, to to back up a little bit. I, I, now later, I do want to talk about the infiltration of the of the offices and the lawsuits and all this. But let's just back up to some basics first. Mm -hmm. What does Scientology believe about God? I mean, what what is what is the the doctrines of Scientology? Well, it's it's very fuzzy. Hubbard basically said that, you know, you got to come to your own conclusion about what God is, and that that's not, you know, that's outside of you know Western religious thought, but not so outside of Eastern religious thought, you know. Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, in the Buddhist sort of genre is that's kind of a little more like that. He said that their uh, life is broken into eight parts, and 
These are called the eight dynamics in Scientology, and it starts with yourself as the first dynamic, and then it spreads out in, in these concentric circles. The second dynamic is your family. The third dynamic is your friends and groups that you associate. The fourth dynamic is mankind. The fifth dynamic is living things. The sixth dynamic is physical objects. The seventh dynamic is spiritual beings. And the eighth dynamic is infinity or God or whatever you want it to be. And because this issue of do Scientologists believe in God um, is sort of a a common question that gets posed to Scientologists when they try and say we're religious just like everybody else. They the the pat answer is well yes we believe in God because see we have this eighth dynamic and the eighth dynamic is the quote God dynamic. It's actually the infinity dynamic and it you know it's all very vague. There's certainly no anthropomorphic anthropomorphic, whatever that word is, God in Scientology, though it's funny, you see there is a book that's called The Introduction to Scientology Ethics. In fact, The Introduction to Scientology Ethics has right on its cover what you would probably consider to be a godlike figure. Um, you know, as it's represented commonly in in Western <laughs> religions, so it's a uh, there's a lot of a lot of um, pretense that goes along with these religious trappings in Scientology, and they are that pretense is there in order to protect this very important protection for Scientology of being able to claim religious status and hide behind the, the law that protects legitimate religions. Now, now the spiritual problem that, that Scientology deals with, it, it's not really like sin or forgiveness of sin, but this, uh, this concept of uh, engrams. What is an engram and how do you go about clearing them? Okay, well, let me just clarify something first. I will answer you about engrams, but it is both because sin is a big part of Scientology, and I'll get to explain that. An engram is what Hubbard claimed in Dianetics, his book, is what it forms the reactive mind. And the reactive mind is your the mind that every person on this earth has that is a stimulus response mind that is composed of these things called engrams. And engrams are moments of pain or unconsciousness where commands are, are inserted into this, this mind which react in the future when you, when you have a similar occurrence. Let me give you an example that will make it easier to understand. So. A kid gets into a fight and his friend hits him on the head with a baseball bat and says, I hate you, you're a cheat. And this in, in, in Dianetics is recorded as an engram. He knocks him out, he's on the ground, he's telling him you're a cheat, you're a cheat, you're a cheat. Later in life, the the sound of a baseball bat hitting someone's head and a person yelling your cheat restimulates or brings back that moment in his reactive mind and suddenly the person gets a headache and a feeling like I'm really tired and I'm going to fall asleep or faints. Those things in Dianetics, this is what Hubbard said, is the cause of your pains, emotions, upsets, that if you can locate these engrams with Dianetics, you can do a sort of regressive theory, you know, relief of them, 
by going back to the beginning of that incident and going through and recounting it and recounting it until it dissipates. And that is the, the sort of objective of Dianetics is to get rid of all of those engrams in your reactive mind. And when you have done that, you become what Hubbard said is a clear. You have cleared yourself of all your uh, all the things that may negatively influence you in your life. And he says in Dianetics that a clear will have basically an eidetic memory and will never get sick. They don't get colds. They're like the perfect, perfect human being. Well, that didn't turn out to be true. And that was why I was saying so. Then the next thing became, well, actually, we need to address the spirit. So we need Scientology in order to make the, the promises of Dianetics come true. But you talked about sin. And this is a huge thing in Scientology, but not like it is, not like you may be used to dealing with this. Hubbard also invented this concept that he called the overt motivator sequence. And the overt motivator sequence, overt is a word that he coined. And this is another thing about Scientology, James. There is jargon to like beyond comprehension almost in Scientology. And it makes it for a very insular bubble-like world where the only people that actually understand what you're talking about are other Scientologists. You can't even hardly have a conversation with other people because you get so used to using these Scientology terms that you kind of forget and people are staring at you going, well, I don't they, know. They, they have more acronyms than members. Yeah, exactly. So this thing called the overt motivated sequence, an overt is a sin or a transgression, something that you do that you shouldn't have done. A motivator is, comes after the overt in Hubbard theory, and a motivator is something that you receive bad because you are craving a bad thing happening to you for having done a bad thing to another. Now, that concept sounds sort of like, yeah, okay, well, it's not that crazy. <laughs> In Scientology practice, it is absolutely crazy It because it is absolute. So if I walk out of my house right now and I walk out into the street and I get hit by a car, the Scientology answer to that is to find when I was driving a car and ran over someone. And that will relieve me of the need to be hit by a car. Now, in, in your book, A Billion Years, you talked about this idea of drawing it in. What have I done to draw this in? So, so that that's the exact, it's actually the, the phrase in Scientology is, what did I do to pull it in? Pull it in. I'm sorry. Pull it in. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, but you're you're good. You're like you've really got a lot of this down, James. Believe me. Uh, so if I got like I said, if I walked out there and I got hit by a car, the Scientological reaction to that is, what did you do to pull it in? What what? So now you go and sit on the e meter and you find the time when you ran over someone with a car or did something similar to that, uh, it may be in a spaceship that you mowed someone down it with. Could, because it could be past lives as well exactly. that you're trying to, to locate and audit. Exactly, yeah. because the theory is you only get relief from things, both in Dianetics and Scientology, when you get to the very earliest moment that you did that, uh, like, I don't want to get too complicated in explaining this theory of auditing, but you if you can't find something in this lifetime, you close your eyes and start dreaming up, and the person on the other side of the emitter guides you and says, well, this this the meter's reacting to this. The yes, the meter is telling me that this is true. And 
this Mida is um, one of Hubbard's evil strokes of genius because that Mida is promised and every Scientologist believes that the Mida always tells the truth. It's Now, the it's, meter you're talking about, the E-meter has a needle, and you're holding the cans, you're holding those metal cylinders that are connected with alligator clips and wires back to this suitcase full of electronics. And every time you, the auditor asks you a question and you react, the needle is reacting, correct? T t take us through that. Yes, and, and it, it's the the... The absolute evil genius of this is it's a mechanical device, and there is no question. It's just a it's a Wheatstone bridge, a sophisticated Wheatstone bridge. It is literally just a current being passed through and measuring the resistance to the current. So there is this tiny current that passes through your body because you're holding these two cans. And the connection for the cans through this meter is your corporate corporeal body. So somehow Hubbard has convinced every Scientologist that this e-meter, this device, measures your emotions. Your It will tell whether you're telling the truth. It, it, it's like this crazy thing that every Scientologist absolutely 100% believes. So when you're sitting there and you go, gosh, I don't think that I, uh, you know, I ever did anything like that before. Well, give it another look. Give it another, think about that. And when you think there is some reaction, then they go, well, what was, what were you thinking? Oh, God, I don't know. Well, think about, you know, focus, focus. What were you thinking? And the, the, the other bit of the, the absolute genius of this is Hubbard says, the emitter reacts below your level of consciousness. So even though it may not be something that particularly makes sense to you or isn't even very real to you, the idea is, well, the person on the other side of the meter is looking and they're going to tell you, well, yeah, that really was real because it's measuring something that's below your level of consciousness, but the emitter knows. So... So Memories is, get implanted. It's not just about uh, clearing these past events out of these engrams or what have you. Because of this idea of overts, which is kind of like sin, and Scientology's understanding of ethics and what what is uh, ethical in Scientology, they can also use the e-meter for a security check. Uh, tell us what that's like. Okay, so a security check is literally asking you questions. Um, and there are some pretty infamous ones <laughs> that are published in Scientology that Hubbard came up with, uh, particularly uh, one, one that's called the Johannesburg Security Check, which includes all sorts of, of things that are still extant today, but about you know, if you've had sexual relations with a person of another race and like real stuff that like is really, really um, socially uh, frowned upon is too light a term these days to describe. But because it's written by Albert, it's still a thing in Scientology. But you get sat down on an e-meter and they ask you, um, are you an FBI agent? Are you here? Have you been sent here to gather information for the media? Are you uh, are you a plant? Are you like, have you stolen money from the organization? And if you protest and uh, or answer no and say no, I haven't, but there is some reaction on the e-meter, this interrogation can go on hours and hours and hours going around into okay well what yeah, let's take another look what exactly what now about uh, you know and and there is this thing in Scientology and I mentioned it in the book that Hubbard invented that he called the murder routine and if you are asking someone you know 
did you did you uh have uh sexual relations with someone that wasn't your wife oh no 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 i no never have oh well it's reading on the meter so tell me about it. you better you better cough up you better cough up you better cough up and if that goes on for long enough it, the the question instead becomes did you rape someone because the theory is uh if you had just had an affair that's a lesser thing to admit to than raping someone. Eventually it gets to, did you murder your wife? That's why it's called the murder routine. Uh, no, 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 I didn't murder my wife. I just had an affair. So this is a very, very um, dangerous activity uh, in my view now. I mean, at the time when I was in Scientology, I considered that this was the greatest thing since sliced bread. This was the... This was the ultimate salvation of myself and every person on planet Earth. Yeah, and one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is you, you, you kind of put a human face on it. You know, I mean, you, you were, you know, when we're going through our litigation with Church Scientology and, and, and everything was going on, I'm, um, you know, uh, I perceived you as, as the chief enemy. You know, uh, we, we regularly, um, almost weekly f for a period of time, were being contacted by Church of Science, uh, the Office of Special Affairs out of Austin for the state of Texas. And, uh, you know, you were uh, her boss's boss's boss. And so it was like, uh, uh, you know, I never would have perceived you of coming out of, uh, ever coming out of this. But, I've been told um, by Scientologists that Scientology is the most ethical of any organization in human history. Yes. So can you explain from a Scientology perspective why everything you did was very ethical? Can you explain that to us. Well, it's, it's pretty simple, James. The, the concept is that something is good if it is the greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics, those things that I mentioned earlier, the, the, the urges towards survival that go from yourself all the way out to infinity. And that, you know, Hubbard, Hubbard explains in a couple of places and he says, well, you know, if you come up with a, with a vaccine that saves a million people but kills 50 in the process of developing it, Obviously, that's good. That's for the overall greatest good. So a million people get saved, 50 people get killed. You got to, like, there's some casualties in, in any endeavor that is going to better things. So in the world of Scientology, the idea that Scientology is the only route to spiritual freedom the only route for salvation for every man, woman, and child on planet Earth is a, an article of faith. And, um, you know, Scientology says don't, we don't believe anything. We just practice things and we see if they work. And, well, that's some, that's some real bull crap. Uh, Scientology believes, Scientologists are expected to believe a lot of things. Um, and, Fundamental to that belief is that Scientology is the, the only hope that all people on this earth have, and that everything else is, a, is false hope, everything else has no technology, everything else is, you know, has failed over thousands of years or hundreds of years or whatever to bring about any resolution to the to the problems of the world, we are the new answer and we have all the answers. So if someone is seeking to prevent us from saving the world, those people can be sacrificed for the cause because the entire world will benefit if the Watchman Fellowship disappears because they are opposed to Scientology or the cult awareness network is eradicated or people's lives are, are screwed up and they get shuttered into silence. And that is the, the mindset of Scientology, that 
those people who seek to stop Scientology in some fashion. And when I say stop, you know, like I said, it's not that they're going to come in with guns and mow people down in a synagogue. It's that they are questioning whether Scientology is really valid or whether, you know, the promises that are made are really uh, kept or whether Scientology actually breaks up families or takes people's money and puts them into bankruptcy and those sort of things. They don't like people questioning that because it creates bad public relations and bad public relations results in less people coming into Scientology and we got to get everybody in. Yeah, I, I think I have noticed that. And, and that's one of the things that over the, these decades of interacting uh, with Scientologists, uh, you, you see that there really is this mission. And, and you talk about it in, in a billion years, this, this idea that what you're doing, th- th- it's not just the future of, a, of an organization. I mean, uh, world civilization, humankind stands in the balance of being able to somehow get the planet cleared. Yes, and so it, 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 everybody. So you talk about um, you know choices that you make with with your children and 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 not being there to to raise them directly and these kinds of things. You you, you justify that because of this idea that one day they'll thank you for it because you're saving humankind. So the ethics to me, it seems like what you're saying is if it promote Scientology, it's automatically ethical. And if it questions in any way or denigrates in any way, Scientology, by by definition, that makes it unethical. Is that fair? Absolutely. You you would make a perfect Scientologist. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you know, you're, you were head of the church's, uh, I said, uh, feared and dreaded, but the, the, the International Office of Special Affairs. But in your book, you talk about the, the, even the foundation of that organization that you were the head of. It goes back uh, to, in fact, it's almost like a rebranding of something that was called the Guardian's Office. And this was headed up by uh, L. Ron Hubbard's wife, uh, Mary Sue Hubbard. Uh, can you tell me about the fiasco that happened to the original Guardian's Office and why they had to do this rebranding? Yeah, sure. Um, the original Guardian's Office, like you said, headed by Mary Sue Hubbard, Hubbard's wife, was created by Hubbard in 1966 to protect Scientology. Um, I, I won't go into all the details about why and what was going on, but he then started writing um, uh, his, quote, technology on how the Guardian's office was to conduct itself in order to protect Scientology. And that included um, Hubbard, Hubbard sort of thought himself a, as, a, as sort of an intelligence officer. And so he created a part of the Guardian's office called the Intelligence Bureau. And the Intelligence Bureau was like, you know, the James Bond gang. They uh, had the case agents and case officers and, uh, you know, breaking and entering equipment and uh, suitable guys, uh, uh, personas and false IDs and also like all of this stuff because Hubbard believed that there was a conspiracy afoot between the World Federation of Mental Health and various governments around the world, particularly the United States government. And you you alluded earlier to, well, didn't Scientology get in trouble with the Food and Drug Administration? Yes, it did, and was raided by the Food and Drug Administration, etc. There were all these problems that had happened, and Hubbard was convinced that this was a grand conspiracy to destroy Scientology by these government agencies. And so the Guardian's office set about infiltrating those government agencies and spying on them and taking their files and their documents and ultimately got caught. Two of their agents got caught infiltrating the IRS headquarters in Washington, D.C. They were arrested by the FBI. Then they were out on bail. And one of them 
was uh, a guy named Michael Meisner, and he was a Guardian's office person. And Meisner was whisked away to Los Angeles, and Meisner said, we need to go sort of cough up. I'm arrested. I have to make an appearance. I'm being arraigned. I have to make an appearance. And the Guardian's office was, no, you're not you're, you're not going to go appear. And he was effectively kidnapped not effectively, he was kidnapped by the Guardian's office that drove him around to safe houses uh, with, his, with you know, his hands tied and a tennis ball in his mouth so he couldn't scream out, moving him from house to house. He eventually played good and said, oh, yeah, I agree, I agree, and then escaped, and he went straight to the FBI. And when he went to the FBI, they then had suitable cause to go to a court and get a warrant to raid the Churches of Scientology buildings in Washington, D.C. and Los Angeles, and did so in 1977. And the documents that they got from the Guardian's office files there were phenomenal, incredible, damaging information that resulted in the prosecution of Mary Sue Hubbard and 10 other leaders of the Guardian's office. And in the course of that, all sorts of documents came out. I recommend a wonderful book written by Tony Ortega called The Unbreakable Miss Lovely about a journalist called Paulette Cooper, who was one of the targets of these, the Guardian's office dirty tricks. You know, they sought to frame her for threatening the vice president and uh, bombing the Church of Scientology. And she was being criminally prosecuted by the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. They sought to get her incarcerated in a mental institution. They sought to, uh, to assist her to <laughs> commit suicide. And these things were all in the documents that, they, that the government got along with evidence of them infiltrating various government agencies and the Better Business Bureau and like anybody. And that resulted in some pretty terrible PR for Scientology <laughs> and for L. Ron Hubbard, because L. Ron Hubbard was named an unindicted co-conspirator in that investigation and was terrified that he was going to be named as an actual, you know, charged with the, the same crimes as his wife. The, the, his wife and all those Guardians Office people protected Hubbard, and he was never ultimately named. But yeah, you, in your book, you talked about that basically uh, after, after uh, his wife basically. Uh, you know, lay down on her sword for him that, that that basically he would have nothing to do with her the rest of his life that he didn't right. want to be near her or uh, it's just amazing that the people around him were willing to sacrifice anything to make certain that he was not tainted by those crimes exactly so long story short the the um People who worked most directly for Hubbard, what he called the Commodore's Messengers, which were his originally when the, the thing is called the Sea Organization because Hubbard fled to a ship because it's out, you know, you go into international waters and there's no government has any jurisdiction over you. So he thought he was safe on a ship. And that's why it's a Sea Org, Sea Org contract. He's, he, sort of made his own little navy um, with ranks and ratings and sea org, uh, you know, naval technology. But the Sea Org, um, and I, you know, I was with him originally on his ship in the Mediterranean when I first joined the Sea Org, and he had these children at the time who were his messengers. He sat in his office up on the top deck of the ship and sent little kids out to to run the place and get messages and tell go tell this guy this and come back and tell me what he says those people became his most trusted most trusted um like uh vessels 
for whatever he wanted done. And I ultimately became one of those Commodore's messengers and, you know, worked directly with him and trained with him to be a Commodore's messenger. And when the Guardian's office ultimately did uh, a terrible screw up and accepted service of a civil suit for L. Ron Hubbard, he said, okay, enough is enough. We need to get rid of this. We need to disband this whole thing. They're all trying to get me. He was very paranoid. Um, and the people that he turned to to accomplish that objective of getting rid of the Guardian's office was the Commodore's messengers, which I was one of. And the person who was he put in charge of getting rid of the Guardian's office was David Miscavige. And David Miscavige ultimately became the successor to L. Ron Hubbard subsequent to that. There's a lot that goes on between those two events and I and I describe it pretty in pretty great detail in my book perhaps for the first time how David Miscavige managed to become the successor of L. Ron Hubbard when he really wasn't the successor of L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs>